The second question we ask ourselves when doing educational analysis is what are the different types of specialization and the relationship uh, between them? Now this follows quite logically on from the first question. Uh, the first question asked what is the relationship between the everyday world and the specialized world? And now what we're doing is we're moving into the specialized world and we're taking a look at the different types of specialization which are possible. Let's start off immediately with the relationship between specializations. What I've tried to do in the diagram that's in front of you is try to catch the boundary relationship between different subjects or specialization as either being solid, in which case I've drawn a solid line, or being open, in which case I've drawn a broken line. By a solid line between the different subjects, or specializations. What we mean is, is that they are strongly separated from each other. They're done distinctly by different teachers in different classrooms at different times with different books and they've got different strong different identities. An open line means integration between the different subjects and this is where teachers will get together between subjects. They'll choose some kind of a theme and they'll use the different subjects to understand the theme. So, for example, if you're doing something like uh, HIV AIDS and you want to understand how it works, you can do the science of HIV AIDS, you can do the history of HIV AIDS, and you can do some of the maths of, of the infections and how it's been fought uh, through the number of infections. What you can also see in the diagram is that you've got both the relationship uh, between everyday experience and specializations as being open or solid and then the relationship between different specializations as being open or solid and slowly but surely as we move through this video lecture set and as you move through my book you'll see that the questions build on each other quite systematically it's one thing to understand the nature of the relationship between different specializations it's a very different thing to understand why there are different types of specializations and how different specializations work. Now what I'd like to do in order to try and explain uh, some basic logics of different types of specializations is to talk about the way that they work on the one side with levels and on the other side with connections. Now let's start off with levels uh, and what you have in front of you is a very simple picture of 10 different elements which have been combined together to make one whole. Uh, I want to give a simple mantra for you to understand that and that is that the many, that is the ten different little elements, have become one, that's the one set of ten, and been increased by one. Where there were ten, there's now eleven, and the eleventh is the ten combined together. Now something weird happens in this process. On the one side, the emergence of the concept 10 is actually a simplification. It takes the nine numbers, it simplifies it into tens, and then you can count in tens, 10, 20, 30, 40. But in another way, the 10 actually contains within itself the numbers uh, 1, 2, 10. So you have a weird situation where the many become one and are increased by one, and at the same time as that, it simplifies the process, but also makes it more complex. And that is the basic logic which I want to point out to in terms of specializations. So let's carry on the logic just to get a sense of it. What we have here now are instead of two levels, we have three levels. We have the ones, we have the tens, and emerging from ten tens combined is the concept of hundreds. And in the same way, hundreds on one level are far more simple to understand than all the various tens and numbers combined. But on another level, within itself, it contains the complexity at the moment that it actually simplifies things. And in this case, the many, the ones and the tens, have become one, a hundred, and they've been increased by one. They've been increased by the concept of hundreds. And so we move on to thousands or hundreds of thousands, or millions, or billions. Now the reason why this is such a key logic 
for the way that specialization works is that it makes the concepts which are used heavier and heavier and heavier. And as you learn the concepts and the concepts start to build on other concepts, you land up in a situation where when uh, a specialist uses one term, that term contains within itself so many other meanings. And that's why people kind of say, I suppose, when they hear a professor speak and they go, he's heavy, man. And I think there's something true about that. The reason why he's heavy is contained within the concepts he is using. There are so many other concepts intensely combined into that. And that is the first way that specializations work through ensuring that the concepts which are used become heavier and heavier or more and more complex. But never forget that in the process of doing that, the actual concept, new concept which is used, is actually a simplification. It catches everything in a term. And this is why when you see specialists working, although they're using very complex terms which contain a lot of information, for them, they are simply working with them as single units. So imagine in this situation they're working with units which contain a thousand things in them. A specialist would be working with that as one thing and combining it with another thing that has a thousand elements in it. And it might sound incredibly profound to someone who is not inducted into that specialization. But for the specialist who's used to working at the high level, he's simply combining single elements together except those single elements aren't just units of one, those single elements are units, for example, of a thousand bits of meaning contained within them. So it's a very profound mantra which sits at the heart of the way specializations work. If the heaviness of concepts gives us a first key insight into the nature of how specializations work, the second thing you've got to work with and identify when doing educational analysis in terms of specializations is the way they work with connections. Now over here you can have a basic difference between uh, disciplines which work with very simple logical connections and those were some of the logical connections I showed you in the last video with Aristotle. Uh, they're basic and or if but very clear, very precise and you can build with them. Uh, you find this a lot in science. Here's an example. Uh, the student says, Sir, is this the case for all uh, reactions? And the teacher says, Well, generally speaking, in all cases, a more reactive metal will replace a less reactive metal. And there you can see that the student is actually learning a basic set of connections which gives a principle. If the student can identify uh, the more reactive metal, the student knows that that will replace a less reactive metal. The connection between them is crystal clear. Now, other specializations work very differently to that. They have very complex connections. Uh, the connections uh, work with all sorts of qualifiers, all sorts of ambiguities, all sorts of subtleties. Now this can make for wonderful complexity in terms of the nuance of working between uh, two elements. But at the same time as that, it does mean that you have a situation where you have to track very carefully what is going on between two elements. Take a look at this history teacher responding to a student's question. The student asks, did everyone move away from their home industries? And the teacher says, well, some did manage to hold out, but you had to be very specialized to compete because as soon as you had a power loom and are mass producing something, it's far cheaper than what you can produce at home. However, if you were specializing in silk, you would not have to. But the demands of the market meant that most had to move to factories. Now, it's a wonderful example of a teacher very good at her job giving a complex explanation to uh, the reasons for the Industrial Revolution. But you can see in the way that the history and the science teachers respond that the science teacher gives a very clear and precise answer, whereas the history teacher has to hedge the story with all sorts of complexities. So there's two 
key considerations you have to hold in mind when asking the second question about the nature of specializations. The first one is the boundary relationship strength between specializations. And here, as we found out, you can either keep the specializations separate or you can integrate the specializations together. In terms of how specializations work, I've briefly described to you how specializations work with levels. They increasingly build higher and higher levels, and all specializations do this, where they take uh, simple elements and combine them into increasingly heavy uh, and more complex concepts. But there's a key difference in the way that specializations work that has to do with their connections. Some specializations are able to work with very simple logical connections, which means they can build and build and build because each of the connections is simple uh, and pure, resulting in less ambiguity, more clarity about what the move should be. Other specializations work with complex connections, and that means that you have to work more subtly, more carefully, and often you have to hedge your bets uh, more and more.